Oh, right. So, um, uh, so I'm, I'm definitely going to finish by half past 12, but I have the advantage I, I, I'm filling in sort of gaps in the program, so I'll be able to sort of spread out a bit later on. <laughs> but you'll see this title is actually very close to the, some of the issues that Heim was talking about, about, you know, if you, if you have these distributed memory systems uh, and they have a limit, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you're overwriting stuff, what I'm interested in is how we remember stuff from, you know, in my case, uh, from the early 60s, old TV programmes, they don't seem to have been overwritten. Uh, and and, it, it, and it, it's a major challenge, I think, for uh, models and, and, and our understanding. How can the brain store this stuff when the synapses are being rebuilt, you know, every 20, 24 hours or something? Everybody tells me that the proteins are being re rebuilt and so on. Now, as uh, Rodrigo said, actually, I'm, uh, most people would think of me more as a vision person. I, I've done a lot of work. I mentioned some of it on, on fast visual processing and sort of that sort of thing. But the actual, in fact, if I go, if I go back and look at a bit of my history, uh, uh, I've actually been interested in memory all the time, actually. Uh, so back uh, when I was doing my thesis with a certain Edmund Rolls back in, in the late 70s, and I was doing things like recording in the orbital frontal cortex, one of many structures that I managed to get an electrode into. But, um, so this paper here had some very interesting bimodal neurons, uh, so neurons that would respond to the sight or taste of the same food, so banana cell, I would call them. So, um, uh, you know, at the time, I, I said, this has to be learning. You can't, you can't pre-wire a system to have the same selectivity for, for taste and for vision. You know, why, why do the curved ob the yellow objects have a particular flavour? You have to learn it. And I, so I was actually, after my thesis, I wanted to try and test this um, by... Uh, and uh, actually, the other, the other thing, it's just sort of a grandmother cell, which uh, we've, uh, Ed, Ed and I have been arguing about this one for the last 40 years, but uh, when I get on to my own, my own take on grandmother cells a bit later. But I, I, went, to, after, um, I went to do a postdoc with Max Sonada in, in Canada, and, and, uh, and, uh, and my aim was to test Hebb's hypothesis. We've already heard about that. And, uh, Donald Hebb was still there in, in, in Dalhousie. He was about 83 at the time, and he was having memory problems. And I told him the experiment I was going to do three times in the year, and every time he had to, I had to tell him again, because he was having a few memory problems. But the idea was um, to record from a neuron in the kitten visual cortex, find that it had a response in the left eye, and see if we could, by, we, by pairing it with a, you know, another stimulus in the right eye, could we change the property of the cell. One year of experiment, nothing worked at all. I conclusively proved that anaesthetized, paralyzed kittens don't learn anything. Um, uh, <laughs> So this is a moral for any of you who are worried that your experiments aren't working. It's not necessarily the end of the world. You know, I managed to get a job despite the total failure of that <laughs> experiment. Uh, but actually, I went to... Uh, so I went to... Oh, this, is, this is Hebb's hypothesis. We've already heard it a bit. You know, when, when to, so Carla Schatz uh, cells that, says car, cells that fire together wire together. It's, 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 a, it's a very popular idea. Actually, I went to Paris after that, uh, worked with Yves Prenyak, amongst others, and, we, uh, and again, I was trying to test Hebb's hypothesis, and actually, that, on that occasion, we actually managed to succeed. So the trick was, rather than using natural stimuli, we were actually artificially activating a neuron in the cortex while we were presenting stimuli. So this paper in, in, in Nature, we were, we were changing the orientation selectivity of a cell. So it started up, you know, preferring vertical, then we were, when we were presenting stimuli at a, a slightly oblique, and we could change the orientation preference of the neuron. So, you know, for me, that was, you know, Hebb, Hebb would, was right. There weren't actually many demonstrations, you know, Hebb proposed that in 1949, but actually proving that that's, that's what neurons uh, did took a long time. So, I, yeah, this is just to say that I'm basically, you know, I've, I've always thought that memory was, you know, the key to understanding how the brain does things. Um, but what I want to do today is actually talk about how do we learn to recognize stimuli? I'm going to, I'm going to argue, actually not today, tomorrow, uh, uh, that, that we need spike time dependent plasticity rules, which are a sort of head variant. Um, and I'll argue that they, uh, this sort of rule will make neurons naturally selective to things that repeat. And I think this is actually a very useful way to think of it. We don't store everything. We store th some things if they tend to repeat, uh, is, is the first, first point. Uh, the, other, the other thing I really, uh, uh, and it's absolutely related to what Heim was talking about, how do we still recognize them decades later? 
you know, uh, if, if, you, if you've got a capacity limit and, and you're over, you know, you, so Heim was talking about, well, maybe we can have a refresh process or whatever. But I've got another suggestion, which is very simple. It's, it's actually not a very popular idea, but I think it could work. Uh, and the idea would be that you make neurons very selective, so selective, they don't fire at all unless you present the stimulus that you presented originally. So uh, we're talking about cells with essentially no spontaneous activity, uh, that are totally silent. Um, and uh, that idea has two very controversial ideas in them, uh, most of which people will think I'm completely insane to say this. Firstly, you need grandmother cells, cells which will only respond to very specific stimuli. And the other thing you need are sort of neocortical dark matter, the idea that maybe in your neocortex, most of the cells haven't fired for days, months, maybe years. And uh, the fact is, we, we wouldn't know if that was the case, because if you go and stick an electrode in the brain, you can only pick up the cells that have got some spikes. And it, going back to 1968, somebody, uh, 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 Dave Robinson, pointed out that you know, the, the sex success rate of picking up cells as you go through two millimeters of cortex is way lower than you'd expect on the recording properties of electrodes. You know, uh, uh, you were talking yesterday about you know, uh, recording over you know, 50, 100 microns. Well, if you go through two millimeters of cortex, you've gone within listening distance of hundreds of cells. And yet the average neurophysiologist opens a bottle of champagne if he gets 12 neurons on a track. You know, it, it, it's, uh, uh, that's the sort of way it works. So, it, the possibility is there, and I think, you know, I'd like to throw that out as a, as a, as a, you know, a, a thing to think about. Maybe we've, we've got the wrong idea of what the brain is actually doing most of the time. It would, there are other reasons why it would be very efficient to actually have very quiet neurons. I mean, spikes are expensive. Uh, uh, if you can avoid firing spikes, then you will do that. And it's actually possible that in the neocortex that um, we, we have far fewer cells than we think. That are active, and actually, the, uh, this uh, some of these provocative ideas are all actually in my current um, ERC grant. I'm about sort of about two thirds of the way through, in which I made a whole series of outrageous claims that nobody will believe. But just to see you know, how far I could get, um, I, I would like to claim, and I had, you know, I'm getting more evidence that we can recognise visual and auditory stimulus that we haven't seen for decades. And furthermore, that it's even possible, even if you don't have a reconsolidation process going on, that the, the, the memories can stay intact. And this, this is, uh, so, Yadin, I'm sort of wondering whether, whether you're going to buy this at all. Uh, do we need a, a continuous renewal process, or could memories actually stay intact? Um, I'm also making suggestions that a few repetitions may be enough to store these things for, for, for you know, decades. I'm making other outrageous claims that we can do it all with binary synapses, which, uh, which is, uh, would make life a lot easier, because just saying keeping a synapse either on or off is a lot easier than trying to keep a weight fixed at you know, 0.37 or something. If you, if you had to have a biological mechanism that could maintain a specific synaptic weight over decades, very, very difficult. But if all you have to do is to say, oh, that synapse, I want to keep it, then you're safe. And so the other two ideas are the you know, grandmother cells and neocortical dark matter, which you know, uh, could, could be true, and, uh, and I throw that one open for discussion. So um, I'm trying to, try and do this in two parts, uh, though this maybe won't work, but I'm gonna, in the first part I'm going to be talking about um, my sort of more, you know, my general thing, which is on fast visual processing and, um, and plasticity in visual processing, which I think is memory. Uh, I'll also talk a bit about auditory, auditory processing, and then I'm going to try and compare brains with computer systems. Uh, I don't know how many of you are aware, but there's huge progress in the last few years in computer-based vision and things like this, and recognising objects, you know, Google can do it. Uh, um, the, we're getting to the point where we can make machines that can see, or at least label stimuli, about as good as we can. Um, but the way they learn is totally unbiological. They, uh, they're using an error back propagation rule with you know, hundreds of millions of training cycles, and there's no way that a brain could possibly uh, have time to do that. So what I think we need is to maybe keep the, some of the architectures that are coming out of the computer vision uh, uh, thing 
and then come up with, with, with more intelligent, biologically plausible rules. And that's sort of what I'll be talking about in the second or whatever, third part. I'll see, see how far I get. So um, my sort of main area of uh, which people know me for is in, in fast visual processing. And uh, though I didn't, I certainly didn't invent, invent this, so back in the 70s, Molly Potter at MIT uh, uh, started using what's known as RSVP, uh, ra rapid serial visual presentation. So she showed, for instance, that if you flash images at 10 frames a second, you can, you can see them. You, you, you have no problem. So I'm going to show you um, 30 pictures of animals in a row and just, uh, just see whether you have any problem in, in, uh, in seeing them. So this is 10 frames a second. Contrast is not good here. You know, if you wanted this to work really well, you know, turn the, con uh, turn the lights off. But basically you get the impression, yeah, I saw them, but if I say, you know, write down the 30 names, then you can't because, you know, you maybe remember a couple of them. But the interesting thing is you can throw in uh, outliers from the sequence of animals and you get this interesting phenomenon, which will, uh, you get a sort of jump, things will uh, jump out at you. So uh, I'm going I'm to do the same thing again. Lots of animals, one, one image which is not an animal, I just want to see whether you noticed it. Okay, so off we go. Yeah. I'm going to, can we turn off some of these lights? Because actually the, this is very contrast dependent. So it's, is that possible? Um, but yeah, most people probably <coughs> might have seen the Mona, Mona Lisa, right? Uh, I'm going to make life, that's, uh, the Mona Lisa is, you know, the most famous image in our culture. Um, uh, let's try another one. Yeah, just... Uh, oh, yes, that helps as well. Yes, in the evening it doesn't make any difference. But <laughs> okay. Yeah, contrast actually is important here because uh, the visual system works well with a nice high contrast image. Okay. That'll do, that'll do. Okay, ne uh, next one. Look at the screen and I'm going to show you... Uh, more animals, and you probably saw the, Mona, uh, the Statue of Liberty. That's more interesting because there are an, there are an infinite number of pictures I could take of the, that I could have used for the, uh, the Statue of Liberty. How about another one? <laughs> Did you see uh, Mickey Mouse there? So, uh, Mickey Mouse is an animal, but it, it, this picture is sufficiently <laughs> odd <laughs> that uh, you may have seen it. Um, how about this one? Yeah, so a Scotch lady, actually. Uh, 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 and one last one. So you might think that we don't process all these images, but I think there's no way. You, you have to process them all to a very high level to be able to notice that <coughs> it jumps out. So, you know, you, uh, we are processing all of these images, I think, fully, but you don't remember the things unless they, 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 they stick out, because you know, you, you, your brain has to make a choice. Here it's making a choice that you know, the Mona Lisa, the Statue of Liberty, these are more interesting than the other stuff because it's just boring animals. Although, of course, the pictures of animals are very, very different. They're all very, they're all very there's nothing visually similar between the pictures. So that you, that you couldn't have come up with some rule that said, oh, I'm going to ignore it if it's got such and such a spatial frequency. Uh, yeah, sorry, question. Uh, more of a comment, because I, so you said we don't remember them at all. Uh, but I think uh, in her more, more recent, in Molly's more recent work, I think there's also some experiments in which she just shows a stream even much faster yes. than this. Yep. And then afterwards asks, was there a type of and, and, and you're well and above people, chance. People yes, are absolutely. really good at this, actually. Yeah, 70, 70 frame, 72 frames a second, I think she goes up to now. So you don't even need, you know, uh, 100 milliseconds. Yeah. I mean, a friend of mine just ran an experiment in her lab with, like, 13 millisecond durations. Yeah, and People it. don't realise that they can do it, but they do perform above chance. They're up above chance. So you, you give a, uh, you know, you, you can do it with, here are four images, did you see one of those in a stream that might have, like, 12 pictures at, at, at 13 milliseconds a frame? Yeah, uh, uh, and, and there's a bit of a short-term memory going on that it's enough to use, oh, yeah, I'll go for that one. Even if you are not consciously aware of, you know, epi no episodic memory trace, but the information has been processed. So, um, we, you know, the other thing, you know, that, that's, that shows that we can do 10 frames a second, or actually 70 frames a second. It doesn't tell you how long the, you know, the processing took. There's a question at the back there. Um, yeah, does it also work with less iconic? 
Yeah. Um, but the, the, more, the more familiar it is, the, the, the more likely it is that, that it's going to jump out. So, um, so you, you, you're talking about an RSVP uh, specifically? Yes. So if you just took like, a normal picture of a person, um, would that still work? So if, you, if, if you're in a sequence of animals and you put one human, uh, the human would be enough, uh, sufficiently different for it, you to notice the human, I think, probably. Okay. So it doesn't have to be iconic, no. But anyway, so this, was, this is my you know, most famous paper, if you like, where we just, we just this is back in 19, uh, 19, nine, early 90s, we could buy 60,000 images on CD-ROM, we could just flash them up. Half of them were animals, half of them were not. And what we discovered was that, uh, that people can just make the decision, is there an animal in the picture, very, very efficiently. Uh, and this is the reaction times, um, this around 400 milliseconds. This is the releasing a button. But if you, um, if you take the uh, ERPs recorded at the same time, this is averaged across all targets and all distractors. You can see these two curves absolutely overlap until 150 milliseconds where they split. And that was a, a strong argument that you know even when you don't know what you're looking for the animal non-animal categorization can be done in 150 milliseconds or less yes and here by targets you mean that they are correctly identified by the people they're, they're only we, we don't ask them to say what animal it is they just have to release the button that was animal versus non -animal. yes okay. yes so it's 50 50 animals and non-animals. We don't say anything about what you're looking for and all the all these images have never been seen by the subjects before so they're having to do vision from scratch and it still gets done in 150 milliseconds. So um, I think of, you know, vision is activating memories, that the memories can be the category of animals, but it can also be things like this, you know. Uh, these are just random pictures that are probably known to all of you, uh, not necessarily, but uh, a lot of them will be. And you can sort of feel your brain reacting to this and, and, and you, know, you can introspect about how long it takes. These are two frames a second and clearly you know, this is easy. Uh, uh, and, and you get a full, the full-blown representation being activated each time. Um, you, uh, the last image, did you everybody, everybody see the last image? Is this, this one? It's that, that Dalmatian picture from Psych 101, right? So, now it's interesting because you see that picture for 10 seconds in some psychology uh, uh, undergraduate lecture, and then you come back 20 years later and Simon Thorpe flashes it on the screen, and uh, even if you haven't seen it in the, in the intermediate time, if you've, if you've seen it, if you saw it once, it's probably stuck in your head already. And that, for me, is phenomenal and uh, it, it, in, in one trial learning or at least well 10 seconds maybe or so you could do an experiment where you sort of say you know how long did you have to have somebody saying that here's the head and the, you know, the back legs are here and everything if, you, I mean, if nobody tells you where the dog is you know it, it's no it won't work you come back 50 you know 20 years later and uh, and you'll say oh it's a bunch of black and white dob and blobs but structuring structuring that patch of meaningless rubbish into a dog and at that point it becomes fixed in your brain and, and will stick. Um, so uh, here's another one. It's not the Dalmatian. Can anybody see anything in there? <laughs> Can you like tell me? Oh and have you never seen this before? Yeah okay well done. I think you get you, you deserve a prize. So, um, but basically, people who haven't seen this before actually most of the time you know, can't make any sense of it. But you know, I think probably that's enough. Okay, uh, next time you see it, this one, this one actually more people can get. Can anybody anybody see something in there? Okay, yes, and you haven't seen this before. Okay. Too easy. Uh, but yeah, absolutely, uh, uh, you do that. That process you know, happens online, and I don't know whether you, you know whether you need to sleep on it or whatever to keep it going for decades, but I mean, you're, you're doing this, I think. Mm -hmm. This is culturally dependent. Absolutely, yes. Oh, yeah. all, all of these things, I mean, if, if you'd never seen a horse before, you, you wouldn't be able to make any sense of it. Horse is not a good example, because I assume most people have seen a horse, but 
For example, there is this famous, there are very few pictures like that that I, I found in the literature. One of them is Jesus. So yeah. Uh, yeah, the, um, yeah. And then you, you, people see Jesus in you know, sort of yeah. shrouds and things like this, don't they? Yeah. And, and, and the faces, you see them all over the place, I mean, in clouds and things, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. I think in, in these kinds of images, we are kind of learning, but also building a gestalt, yeah. and then it really gets stuck, and I'm not even sure how can you destroy a gestalt without really interfering with the brain. My point entirely, I mean, I, I haven't proved that people who have never seen the Dalmatian picture for 20 years will recognise it in an RSVP stream. But I've seen suggestive evidence they can, because if you do 10 frames a second of animals and you throw in a Dalmatian picture, it's another, another animal. You, could, you know, your brain could say, oh, another dog, you know. But it doesn't. It says it's that psych, psych 101 thing. I remember the guy who showed me that picture the first time. That is memory. <coughs> That's visual memory in, at work, and, it, and it's incredibly rapid. Uh, I mean, I haven't mentioned it, but Edmund, you know this thing about you show a, a, a moony face, it's just a, bl a black and white face. The first time you see it, you don't necessarily understand it. When you've seen how it is a face, uh, the fMRI signal act, uh, shows that the, uh, the fusiform face, face area got, and the single neurons will do it in a monkey in one trial, right? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, it really works. Now, it's not just vision. Um, uh, the you know, audition works as well. So if I play... No, everybody knows that, right? Beethoven's fifth, you don't need very much. Whoops. Yeah, you recognise that, do you? Prokofiev. It's a bit loud, isn't it? Sorry about that. OK, uh, let's see if you can recognise this one. So you don't need very much, you know. Uh, how about this? More tricky. Rodrigo. No, Rodriguez. <laughs> uh, guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another, another thing in B minor, because I like B minor. What about this? <laughs> Got another one in B minor. <laughs> You're using. <laughs> were you, uh, we got a poster of eagles or something with auditory stimuli. Was, it, was that the one you used? Or? No, 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 but actually, I'm using now for looking for single neural responses. I'm using visual yeah. and some of them. If you know these pieces of music, you don't need very much. And to prove how little you need, I did an experiment. Um, with, on my own memory, or acoustic memory, with my student, my postdoc. This was four years ago, I'm actually 60 now. But I mean, if you, if you look at, at my last FM thing, you will discover that I listen to the Beatles a lot more than other things. <laughs> Thousands of listeners, I've, I've been a fan since 1962. And, 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 uh, and if you take Beatles tracks and play the first 20 milliseconds, or the next 50 or 100, we did an experiment where I, where I measured what the minimum duration was, and, and this is actually mixed up with several hundred tracks of my favourite, you know, iTunes tracks, you know, the ones, the five-star ones. So I'm going to play you um, the very beginning of, all, uh, of Beatles tracks, all of which I can identify with no trouble. So here we go. <coughs> Yeah, easy, wasn't it? Uh, well, not necessarily. <laughs> <laughs> not necessarily. You have to be. You have to be a bit of a Beatles fan like me. But basically, if you were to take your favourite tracks, the stuff that you've listened to hundreds of times, and play just the very beginning of it, it works. It really does. If you're, you know, if you like music, if you don't like music, not necessarily. So, with enough training, in other words, enough repeats. 20 milliseconds, actually, well, here's an illustration. 20 milliseconds of Pink Floyd's echoes is enough for me. It's, it's a, a C-sharp note, bing, um, and that's enough. And I, and I can probably sing the rest of the track and all the rest of it. I, you know, I like music, so I'm, I may be slightly biased. But, I mean, acoustic patterns, very short. Like, like visual stimuli, you can flash <laughs> them up, you can, uh, and, and, and your, your brain will recognise them. 
Uh, but of course, it's absolutely personal history dependent. I mean, uh, you know, unless there are some other serious Beatles fans, those probably won't have worked for you. Now, I've also been doing some stuff more recently with, on formation of auditory memories with my colleagues Trevor Agus and Daniel Presnitzer, where we were using totally meaningless sounds, so we're using Gaussian noise. And uh, the task is you listen to one second of noise, and your task is to say whether the first and the second half were the same or whether it was a continuously refreshed noise. So, um, so here I'm going to give you some uh, uh, trials. The first one uh, is a no trial. I think I'll turn the sound up a little bit here. Uh, no, because it, it, the spectrogram is continuously refreshed. There's nothing to listen, no repeat at all. The next one, you're supposed to say yes. Third one, you're supposed to say yes. Fourth one, yes. Fifth one, no. Sixth one, yes. The seventh one, no. You're probably thinking, this guy is insane. They sound exactly the same. <laughs> but actually, no, because... Uh, and this was shown by, um, in, by Bella Eulish and, and uh, Gut, Gut, Gutman and Eulish in 1963. It's called for Frozen Noise. If you just take any random bit of noise where you know, each sample is just randomly varying around zero and you, you play it over and over again, very rapidly you can hear a structure. So I'm going to take, uh, uh, in fact, this, this sound here, which actually was repeated twice, but I'm going to play it ten times. So just listen to it. Can you hear sort of, it's cyclic. And it's just, it's just meaningless noise. And yet, your auditory system will pick up there's something repeating in there, even though it has no utility. Uh, 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 and this has been known since the, you know, the early 60s. Now, we did this uh, with repeated noise, which you've never heard before. You, you know, D-prime, you're pretty, pretty it's, it's, a, it's a hard task. It's not in, totally impossible. But for the stimuli which were without the subjects knowing, being repeated during the block, you get a lot better. And this effect occurs within the first 10 trials, but not all stimuli work. So some of them work really well, and then some of them don't work at all. It's, a, it's an all or none phenomenon. Um, so this is, the, the, you know, uh, within 10 trials, if it's something that you pick up, then you can do literally 100% correct on saying that's a repeating stimulus, as you did here. And so 10 rep repeats enough, it seems to be all or none, and if you, come, if, you, if you train the subjects here, tell them to go away for three weeks, come back, on the very first trial, they are way above chance. They're actually they're tending to say yes also to other stimuli, but this difference here is absolutely clear on the very first trial, so they haven't forgotten this. Now this is really quite spectacular because many things that you might be given in a learning experiment like you know remember a list of words or or anything you can go away and repeat it and rehearse it but i defy anybody to you know re you know can you imitate the sound you know can you run it back in the, the, the sound in your head the fact is with these sorts of stimuli you need the stimulus to be able to to you know to rehearse it so the consolidation process is non-trivial i mean you, you, you're talking about a uh, you know, a 44 kilohertz uh, uh, wave, wave file, which where every single value is just random. I mean, the amount of data is 44,000 random numbers. And your job is to say whether the first uh, 22,000 and the second 22,000 are the same. I mean, it's a horribly challenging problem, and yet people can do it. The crosses are, these are you know, the hit rate for uh, a, a non-repeating stimulus. So, yeah, I mean, uh, so you get down to chance around here. Yep, question at the back. Is the D prime better for the um, test part? Yeah, I showed you that the previous one was actually the D prime. Whoa, sorry. That's D prime. Yeah, so. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's actually quite interesting to see here that what, what people do is they, they actually have a tendency to, to, say, to say yes a lot. Because they think, they, oh, I've, yeah, that sounds familiar. But in fact, they're, they're, they, they quickly get back to 50-50 on the true, <coughs> truly new, or the, the new one. So, yeah, the D prime looks very nice. Now, um, 
what we don't know is how long this, could you do that, you know, you know, next year. Actually, these subjects were tested in 2009, so uh, we really must get them back in again and see whether, are they above chance on, on stimuli, which they definitely have not heard for, you know, several years. Yeah. Yes, I'm confused there. On the first block, it should be 50% of So on the first block here? No, the left. Here, okay. Now, this is hit rate. It, it, it's, uh, so they, did, they, just, they, just they have a bias towards saying yes. That's all. But if you were a D prime would be uh, actually not zero. It's, you know, it's 0.5. I mean, we are better than chance at, at picking up the repeat. It's, it, 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 you, even, the we, we, even on the very first thing. If there was nothing to work on, you know, uh, how would you learn anything? But there, there is a bit, and you can, you can boost it. Um, now, we've done some other experiments recently with my student, who's just about to submit a thesis, actually, where we took these, these sounds and then looped, the, 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 instead of playing them in the original form, they started at a random point. Okay, so instead of saying 500 milliseconds, you'd start at, say, you know, 233 milliseconds, play that, and then the beginning. Uh, that's one way we can, we can change it. The other thing, we can, we can scramble the stimuli. We, we can chop them up into 20 millisecond slices, or even 10, or actually she's just done it with five millisecond slices, and you just scramble them and uh, mix them all up together. And the, here are results. This is, you know, uh, this is testing. You've trained with one stimulus, and you're testing either with the original thing, when you're getting you know, nearly 70% correct, this is looped, so it's, uh, the beginning is not the same. It's never the same. And yet people are still doing pretty well. And this is really surprising. Uh, 20 or even 10 millisecond slices scrambled randomly on every trial. You never hear the same thing ever again. But there's enough stuff in the 10 millisecond slices for you to be able to perform at above chance. So you scrambled the same scramble in the post Yes, yeah, so you've got, um, yes, in, in the first half and the second half have been scrambled in the same way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it looks like the, the auditory system is learning really short bits, you know, 10 milliseconds or less. So, so if you don't play a different sound, uh, I mean, the same power, but different realizations before. It's Sorry. not scrambling, just different realizations of. So if well, think you random, like you random. Random. Uh, well, yeah. The, uh, 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 uh. No, no, but scramble. You have still the original ten milliseconds. Yes. If you do one millisecond. Yeah. Uh, two milliseconds it doesn't work. Five milliseconds it does. So it, it looks like it's the integration time I would say of the neurons that are doing this. If you want my my guess, uh, if you if you really really scramble it at two milliseconds. So it's, it's not. No, my, my point is it's not that the, the, the subject became. Better, better this type. No, no. In fact, uh, there's very little p performance. I mean, once you've got the hang of the task, basically, you know, you don't get any better. You, you yeah. So, throwing in uh, in the original experiment, we tried reversing the sound, and to because uh, the, the reviewer said, well, what would happen if you reversed? Actually, you were still pretty good on reverse sounds, which actually makes it look as if you're not looking for, a, you know, the tune or something. It's uh, it's actually the sort of acoustic. Uh, components which are being detected as being repeated. Not no boundaries, because uh, here we, uh, and uh, here's, the, here's the ultimate experiment, uh, came out last year. Uh, my colleagues, plus uh, um, two other guys, Thomas Andrian and Sid Quider. This is actually, this, this bit of data is in the supplementary data of this paper. I, they didn't even get, manage to get it into the, into the main pit. <laughs> Um, but what they did, they had subjects listening to eight minutes of, of that sort of noise. Shh. And their task was to press the button if the amplitude modulated. So if it dropped a little bit, then they had to press a button. So they weren't trying to remember anything. And it, during this, they had randomly chosen 200 millisecond uh, slices, which were repeated um, five times. But there were there was no, no markers or anything, and either it was a reference repeated noise, which so this orange thing here was actually repeated here, but these blue ones, you took a 200 millisecond slice, uh, and with a 300 millisecond sp spacing. So in fact, it takes two and a half seconds. You get sh -ch 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 sort of thing, but.
but mixed in the middle of the, you know, and there's, no, there's, there's nothing to listen to. And look at this, this is for me possibly the most amazing bit of data I've seen in a very long time. This is the ERP to the first time this has ever been heard, second, third, fourth, fifth. By the time you've had five repeats in continuous noise, you're getting a, a full-blown ERP of, you know, a, a microvolt. And it's highly reliable, and it's almost as big as what you get when you've had it, when you've had it hundreds of times. Now, the subjects aren't even aware that there's anything going on. At the end of the experiment, they ask the subjects, did you notice anything? And occasionally you get somebody, oh, I heard, I heard something that repeated four times, not five times. It can't be five times, because the first time it, it, it is the same as the background. But not all the subjects reported it. This is, this is implicit learning, non-conscious learning, and it, you get a full-blown ERP. Now, what we don't know is what would, what would happen if these people come back three weeks later. So that's an experiment is absolutely, you know, must be, must do experiment. Yes. Sorry, I think I understood correctly, but I want to clarify. So in case of RM, it is averaged at the start of it. So zero is the start of RM. Yep. And then this, this, this is the sound here. This is the gap, if you like. So, you, so these actually pretty much uh, go directly one onto the next. In fact, you can see it here. Okay. And, uh, and the blue one, uh, well, uh, is that significant? No, I think it's, it's, it's basically nothing significant, but you're getting a significant difference here. On the second target, on the second repeat in meaningless noise, the, it's the, you know, Bella Ulesh thing that you all you experience, you know, 10 repeats and you've got it. I mean, you can hear it going on, or whatever. And your auditory system is picking this up. That's, that's, a chain, uh, that's a major challenge, and, 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 and as I say, I don't know, I, ca I can't prove that these ERPs will still be there three weeks later, but I'm prepared to bet anybody a beer that they are, because we, we know that the, the behavioural performance uh, uh, will st still be there a few weeks later. Um, now, it's in, in very interesting that we're actually separating be behavior here from the, the ERP effect. I mean, so the, the subjects don't necessarily uh, know that something's happened, but their brain certainly does. Yes? Sorry, again. Uh, now, which are the electrodes here? Are uh, it's, a, it's a classic, uh, in, in the paper you'll see it's a classic you know, auditory uh, N100 or whatever. It's, it, it's, it's very standard. Um, it could be subcortical. So my student Jaya has been doing this, this sort of thing and looking at the auditory brainstem response, which is, you know, down right in the bottom of the auditory system. And we think that that's being modified. And it's actually the right place to do this. We're talking about, you know, really, really low level stuff. It's just, you know, what the auditory nerve fibers are doing sort of thing. So uh, you, we, it may not even be cortical. It could be subcortical. And we've actually got some fMRI data that the medial geniculate nucleus um, shows differences after training. Although you can never be sure with ERPs, uh, is, is it the auditory cortex that says, oh, this is familiar, and, and I'll modulate the activity in the geniculate. But when you get a, if it's true, and I am putting a little bit of condition on it, if the auditory brainstem response, which has a latency of five milliseconds, is being modified by this, then that means that the brain is doing an amazing job right from the, right from the input. So, um, what am I going to be able to get through in, in the remaining 10 minutes? Um, oh, how long do memories last? This is, you know, I was sort of saying, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 um, the Dalmatian dog thing for people who had seen it in a, in a psychology course before. Actually, who hadn't seen it before at all? That would have been interesting. And you've, you've all seen the Dalmatian now. Okay. So, well, you can do the experiment your, your, uh, yourself, or maybe uh, ask me to send you a, a, an RSVP clip. Uh, and I'll have, you know, one, one will have the dog in it, and the other one will have Mickey Mouse, and you have to say which one, which one was. You know, I, I think it's probably <laughs> enough. Uh, the other way you can ask this is, uh, and it's, this is moving into the real world, is to, is to, um, is to say, uh, you know, take old TV programs like this. 
How many people know this? It's pretty old stuff. Ah, uh, you see, I've got a, there are too many young people here. There's a, <laughs> uh, this, is, this, is, this is old, early 70s, uh, classic American comedy program. But how about this one? So, um, you know, these are, these are well known in, in most countries' cultures, but we've got the most diverse set of people here I think I've ever talked to, so try to guess what programmes you will know. It's difficult, but we've, with my student, Christelle Lazabel, we've actually been exploiting the French um, uh, Institut National Audiovisuel. They've actually digitised all French TV broadcasts, starting <coughs> from 1954 or something. Uh, and we've managed to locate 70 different TV series which have never, ever been broadcast, rebroadcast. We know for a fact, because it, th these are the people who control it. Okay, uh, uh, um, so no, uh, no repeats of, uh, on, you can't get them on YouTube and whatever. So we've been... I'm sorry? Well, that's the big question. So we, we tested people who are... I mean, not recording their brain. Uh, we, 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 yes, that's the experiment. We, we, haven't done, we haven't stuck any electrodes on anybody yet because these are old age pensioners in, in old, old folks' homes and we test them. Uh, and we've only tested about 30 so far because it's actually very time consuming to go through the 70 plus another, you know, another 70 fami more familiar stuff because we, we, we mix the, the, the obscure things. But for instance, um, it's in interesting, we just take the, the, the initial credits, which in, in, for these old t French things actually have original compositions. They had a, a French uh, uh, Société de Production actually employed uh, professional composers for the credit music. Uh, and, and so everything was totally original. <laughs> and in fact, it's quite interesting when you listen to these things. They tend to be things which have something, you know, something unusual, like you know, clarinets plus drums or something. You know, some, something which is, which is distinctive. It's almost deliberately done so. And then when we tested the people, well, we've got you know a a couple of uh, very clear examples. A 90-year-old woman said, "Oh, Balzac, je regarde ça le samedi après-midi." Um, uh, so we just, you know, write down what they say, and that was true. It was, you know, the programme was called Amour de Balzac, and another one, the title was Les Facités du Sapeur Camembert, and a 77-year-old man said, oh, Camembert, je regarde les samedi dimanche soir. So, yeah, we got a couple of absolute, you know, no, no, no doubt they could remember it, and they have not possibly seen this, you know, uh, in several decades. So uh, this is the challenge for the consolidation view. Do you think these people are, you know, we asked them, you know, have you, do you talk about this? Were well, you a sort of big super fan? I mean, do you, is it, uh, the fact is, it, it, you, you don't find anything about these programs on the web because they're, they're, really, they're really pretty obscure. And the people will say, no, I, haven't, I don't remember ever thinking about it again. And so it's fairly safe, fairly safe that uh, they probably didn't have a chance to... Uh, why, is it, why is it a challenge to the consolidation? Oh, it's, it's just, I mean, if, uh, if you wanted to say, and sort of what Heim was saying, if you want all these, uh, the, you know, you're piling in new stuff every day and no, you no, want... That's, no, that's internal. That's internal. That's something okay. you don't... Yeah, you don't want, right, okay, so you could, yeah, in fact, uh, Misha Sodix, when I told him that, oh, yeah, you dream about it. And, and, and I can't rule out the possibility yeah, that... Yeah, he says he dreams about, dream about it. That's his problem. But I, I think that's the problem. The idea is that it's probably, part of it probably happens in sleep, not necessarily in dream sleep, actually. Okay. But in general. Okay, so, so uh, but let, we could have a little... I reckon that we've all had the experience of, at least once in our life, of maybe going into an old second-hand bookshop and then discovering the, 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 the book that you had as a, to, you learned to read with at school. Uh, and, oh, yeah, I reckon that, 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 that's Janet and John or something, you know, or whatever it is for you. Now, you know, it's always possible that you, you, you know, you have a refresh mode that every, you know, so many days or every so many months or every so many years you refresh that memory but i would like to raise the possibility that actually no we don't need that and the, and the brain will keep those memories intact and they're 
actually, and that's the suggestion, that these are neurons that you've got for Amour de Balzac or whatever, which have just been totally silent ever since. And they're just sort of sitting around waiting for you know, Bewitched or Mission Impossible to come back on again. But it's a speculation. Yes? Um, so, the question, uh, clearly you remember things which are emotionally important much better, you know, and, and we have flashbulb memories for, you know, that everybody remembers 9-11 and, you know, uh, and when Ken if you were around in 1963, you can remember when, you know, where you were when you heard that Kennedy had been assassinated, things like that. And then, uh, uh, so these are highly significant things, but there's an awful lot of stuff where I think it's just, uh, it just, it just repeats. So, you know, it annoys me to death that, that uh, you know, somebody plays that stupid jingle on the radio for, for, for an advertising, and it's going to stick in my head whether I want to or not. Uh, uh, and, and that's why they do it, by the way. Uh, advertisers do know perfectly well that with N repeats, uh, you, you know, you, you can remember uh, the, the jingle for that program or for that, for that product. Um, and it's not because it's, I want to learn it, there's no motivational thing, it's just pure repeats. In the same way as what I just showed you with, with auditory noise rep repetition, I mean, there's no, there's no emotional thing. I mean, the subjects weren't even aware that they were doing something and their brains were picking it up. It seems to me that there is a definite um, uh, uh, decoupling between emotional, I mean, I'm not, I'm not wanting to deny that emotional Im impact is not important or you know, whether it's reinforcing or whatever, but I think the brain has to be equipped with a thing that can pick up the repeats. And then afterwards, if you, once you've got the representation, you can decide to connect it to, you know, that's positive, that's negative, uh, that's dangerous, that's uh, whatever. But the basic mechanism, I would claim, has to have just repeating as being the, the trick for what determines whether you learn it or not. That's why I, 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 what I... So, we're going to stop in four minutes, but... Um, Good question. But maybe it's for the discussion for later, but do you think, I mean, when you... For example, there's an episode of these things that you have seen when you were a kid, and you haven't seen, and you know that you haven't seen or think about these for decades. Do you think you still have something like an episodic memory that you remember the episode what happened, or it's just a month? Well, you can be, but, uh, you know, um, my, my, my son recently bought me the entire... Uh, Thund Thunderbirds uh, DVD set, you know, it's about 20 hours of TV programs. And, 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 and I've tried to watch, this is an old cartoon thing from the 60s, you know, it came out in 1965, 66 in the UK. It was rerun in, in the UK recently, like about 10 years ago. So it's actually more familiar now, but I hadn't watched it since. And, uh, and, uh, and I can, you know, watching some of these things, you know, I can, the, the, the shape of the spacecraft and, the, you know, the, uh, the things, I can, I, you know, they, they were sort of in my head, you know, and, I, and did, I, did I rehearse those deliberately? I, I doubt it, but, um, uh, yeah, sorry, hi. I just have a comment to, maybe to clarify. The, the issue, at least when I spoke about consolidation, I think there are in general two problems that might require or give rise to the possibility of consolidation by impression. One is computational, that I raised, uh, which, which may or may not be a worry or problem or a need if, if you have the low capacity, then fine. There is no need to consolidate. There is no need to, to have weight decay. You can just store everything. Uh, that, that, that's what I'm proposing. Yeah. Yeah. The other one, I think, is mechanistic. How come uh, those synaptic traces or whatever, memory traces, what stabilize them over a long period of time? I think that is more what the Dean's worry is about. And I think we should discuss these two different aspects. Absolutely. I mean, I think there's, you know, the molecular biology of, you know, what is actually happening and, you know... Uh, right, so the fact that the law is quiet for decades, it does not solve necessarily the problem. Well, it, it makes I mean, it, it safe. There still be synaptic traces. Yes, yes. But is the it, question is what, what's the okay. like? But just to cut to the, the end of the argument, for me, if you've got a neuron which you stimulated with some noise pattern, 
So you've got a neuron, it's you know, listening to the auditory nerve. Some pattern came in with some particular combination of frequencies, it's and it's extremely unlikely to happen by chance. So in five milliseconds, it, you had that particular combination of no, no, fibers. This, this, this filter, this feature, has to be in the synaptic waves. Yes, absolutely. And then they asked you to tell me a story, a molecular biology story, that these synaptic patterns are stable. So all I'm going to say is I think it's done with bin I'm, binary I'm waves. I'm not saying you're wrong or right. I'm just saying this is the, I think, one important just question. <laughs> what, 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 you, what you will hopefully be, if I, if I say within you know, five, two and a half seconds the brain has already produced an engram that you can measure it as an e ERP at one yeah, microvolt yeah. and let's suppose that it stays for weeks, maybe years, you know, we need to test that. Uh, and we can, we can look at the ERP amplitude, you know, the next day mm -hmm. and, and, and yes, so on. Like, I, mean, I, I think just the question, yeah. I think a big question would be, what is the molecular mechanism that would stabilize this engram? And uh, uh, what I would, so what I will be able to show to you that you can do it with binary synapse. <coughs> uh, that's, yeah. that's the next that talk. That's the next talk, but uh, basically uh, all you need to do is, you, let's, you, if you've got a neuron, it's got a thousand inputs, and then you pick off 50 and you give them weights of 1, and the other 950 have weights of 0, that's all I have to keep. I know, but that's Something has to stimulate. Okay, it's 12.30, we're going to go and get, have a, our picture, and, uh, and we will continue the debate. Yeah. <laughs>